Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we are back. And we are picking up where we left off yesterday. And we are on rule three, and this is section two of how to get rich and stay rich. I thought you guys would love that title. Everyone wants to, everyone thinks that they want to be rich. No one really has a definition of what, what that means. And no one really has conceptualized really their plan to actually become rich. Rich is simply where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. So this is day three, probably going to be a day four, even though we thought we were going to do this in three days. So go back and listen to the previous two podcasts on this. Um, and Julie, without any further delay, let's jump back in and rule number three. Three. Well, number three, have hedges against the five biggest financial destroyers. Number one, lifestyle creep. We talked about that yesterday, including in your business. Number two, health bills. How many of you listening don't have health insurance or don't have enough or the right kind of health insurance? Number three, taxes. Number four, complacency, also known as ego sometimes. And number five, divorce. Have hedges against those. Be conscious. Be competent about that and avoid those five big pitfalls. I'm going to talk about point number four because it's the most obtuse. I'm going to use a personal example. Sure. So you and I were living in New Albany, Ohio. We were top of our game. We were selling between 100 and 200 homes per year. We were doing really well. We had been, um, you know, all kinds of acclaim. And this is before we started our coaching business. And I remember you and I just drilled down and we didn't look up and we just were doing what we were doing. And we had been in our essentially our own coal mines, we used to call it, yeah. focusing on the things we focused on without realizing that some of the market forces and some of the market conditions had changed. And then all of a sudden, we found ourselves working the same and then working harder and getting the same results. And it wasn't until we stopped, we took a good look around, we actually traveled and, and went to see what other things were happening in other similar real estate markets. And then we realized that we had allowed complacency to enter into our business and personal lives. And by the way, that was the time where you and I both gained some weight too. Mm-hmm. So it crept in. It's Why? All related, right? Right. Because we allowed ourselves to think that we'd somehow made it. Thinking you've made it is basically the kiss of death. Because you never make it. And by the way, complacency in itself is a fake word because you can never be complacent. Even if you think you don't have to work out anymore or you think you've made it financially or you think you've got it all figured out and you're going to be complacent. You're just, you you know, maybe some of you think your mission in life is to get to the point where you can just, you know, basically go on autopilot. Here's the unfortunate truth. It might take you 10 years, let's say, or 20 years to build up a certain level of success where you're you know, rich, where your money's working for you, you no longer work for your money, and then you decide, well, I'm going to go complacent, I've done it, I'm going to the beach. Well, then what's going to happen is if you're not constantly improving yourself, even after you've actually, quote unquote, made it, you will lose what you have, and you'll lose it faster than you can possibly think. We've seen that happen so many times. Some of you are experiencing that or starting to experience that in your businesses, your personal lives. Please realize what we're telling you is the truth. You don't have to have these big ups and downs in your life. You don't have to have ups and downs with your health, with your relationships, with your business success, with your wealth creation. So do what it takes to wake up. And I'll tell you what works for Julie and I, a little good old fashioned fear, (laughs) right? So here's a little uh, interesting motivational stuff. Everyone thinks, you know, so I'm asking Bob now, Bob, what are you motivated by? You know, the carrot or the stick. Bob's going to tell me he's always motivated by the carrot. Bob's going to say he loves to accomplish goals. He loves all these other things. And to which I'm going to tell Bob with love and respect that he's lying to himself and lying to me. Because the reality of it is, is none of us are truly wired to move towards a goal. All of us are wired. If you really want to motivate yourself, here's what you do. You, if you have fear of losing what you already have, you will be more motivated than you can possibly believe. And so you have, if you can manifest that versus actually having it happen, you will become somebody Uh that has this omnipresent sense of motivation. So the hack for yourself is to never allow yourself to become complacent. Always tell yourself that you could lose what you have, and that will motivate you far more than trying to move towards the accomplishment of a goal. Yes. And by the way, listeners, that can ha- that can happen and does happen at any level, even when you're making a lot of money consistently. I'll give you a quick example. I just had that very conversation yesterday 
with somebody running a big team. He had noticed that one of his listing partners, who was very successful, had stopped, ha uh, typically he'd list about four properties per week, which is great by any measure, right? But he'd been falling back to maybe one or two or zero listings per week. Well, what was up with that? And I asked some questions. Well, as it turns out, this listing partner has no debt, has a VRBO, which is uh, making them some money, has some other investments. Uh, wife just uh, graduated and got a really kick-ass job making about 125,000 a year. So they're pretty comfortable, right? And they live in a great neighborhood. But so what's going to happen? So the conversation was one of two things are going to happen. Exactly the carrot or the stick conversation. And everybody says, well, I'm going to go through towards that carrot. So maybe another round of goal setting, thinking bigger, working on that, a new treasure map. That may be the catalyst because this person we're talking about is pretty smart. They could be. Or something's going to have to happen to recreate that scarcity, the stick, in order for him to feel re-motivated. So some suggestions for that would be, to find, you know, we could do goal setting, but to make him feel like he's uh, got a little scarcity, maybe he's going to prepay his taxes. Maybe he's going to prepay his kid's school tuition to, you know, lower the bank account without making him broke to reignite that motivation. Yeah, that's it, guys. It's the fear of losing what you already have. I, I am compelled to tell the story of Mano. I told them that story yeah. yesterday. All right, yeah. so I had this great coaching client and he's- Monet. Monet, sorry. Yes, Monet. And I'll, the story I'm telling you, he told me, this was before I started coaching him, so I just want to put that disclaimer out there. So evidently, Monet was like super fat and, you know, uh, fat to the point, and he'd been fat so long that his weight had become a massive health problem. Diabetes, the whole thing. He'd go to the doctor when he had this problem or that, and the doctor would say, well, you know, Monet, if you don't lose your weight, your diabetes is going to cause you to essentially develop, I think it's gangrene in your appendages, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to start cutting off your feet and your legs and the rest of it. And horribleness, right? And so Monet, well, whatever, doctor, whatever, I'm just going to be fine. And then he'd, you know, leave the doctor's office and come back when he developed some other problem because when you're overweight, you obviously have a lot of other associated health problems. And he was evidently you know, morbidly obese. This is him telling me this story. So he goes into the doctor and the doctor says, well, guess what? This is the time where we have to schedule the time uh, to remove your, I think it was his right foot or something. So we're going to actually now, because you have such poor circulation in your foot and because you've developed all these other problems, you couldn't even walk on it. We're going to have to surgically remove your foot because you weren't willing to lose weight. And then the nurse came in and started to schedule the operation. That in turn scared the crap as it should out of Monet to the point, and this really happened, this is what he told me, where he not only lost all the weight, but he also lost all the weight and then got in such good shape, he was on like the cover of Men's Fitness Magazine, something insane. Now, I did see he the found picture. found his motivation, apparently. That's right. But I did see the picture. He looked amazing. Now, if the nurse had walked in there and said, Monet, if you go through this fitness routine and lose all this weight, you can be this guy on the cover of a Men's Fitness Magazine, he'd have been like, whatever versus her walking in saying, it's time for us to remove your foot. That's where he got his motivation. So if you want to really know how to motivate yourself, even after you've created a level of abundance, one of the hedges against your own complacency is always figuring out a way to create the uh, mental mindset of losing what you already have. And you, if you keep doing that, you will keep ascending. Now, it's a mindset versus a reality, You right? Like Julie's example. Another, her example is great, right? Guy's got abundance. He's got financial security more than he probably doing ever fine. thought he was. Doing he's doing great. great. But maybe he's got a little too much savings and maybe his, his wife's making a little bit too much consistent income and he realizes he doesn't have to work anymore, which is what is actually happening. So what he would, and Julie said it right, take that uh, money he's got saved, all but maybe six months of savings or maybe 90 days of savings, and then buy in a rental property. Invest that into something that he can't borrow against. Maybe put in the S&P 500 or something, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That is going to re-motivate him because then he's going to be fearful of losing what he already has. That right there is the ultimate motivation hack. Rule number five. Rule number four, invest like Warren Buffett. Don't invest in anything you don't understand. So invest monthly and don't overthink. Vanguard index funds are your friend. And consuming financial content, Ben, by your favorite quotes, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. So this point kind of ties into the previous point. I suspect that one of the reasons that our examples had fallen, once you've got some financial abundance and your debt's paid off and all these things, I think many times it's because they've run out of their financial education. Like 
Rental property. Check. Got one of those. Well, VRBO here, got that. So now what? What about this investing business? You have to educate yourself. Here's what happens is you will start accumulating money. You'll start having a predictable duplicatable income from your real estate business. And then because you think that you have to, then you're going to make a huge mistake, which is you're going to take too many risks with the money that you have now worked so damn hard to have set aside so you can start reinvesting it. And that's where a lot of people make dumb mistakes. Mm -hmm. They start looking for get rich quick schemes. So maybe they've, uh, you know, removed the get rich quick and the shiny object syndrome from their business, but it still is inside of them. They're still looking for shortcuts and hacks. And so what they do is they invest in things they don't understand. We get inv invited to invest in different hedge funds and things on a fairly regular basis. And I have to remind myself to always lean back into what <laughs> Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say. Uh, if I don't understand it, and I'm not the smartest guy on the planet, that's for sure. But if I can't understand what the hell you're trying to save, uh, sell to me, I am not going to invest in it. We did not buy any crypto. We did not buy any NFTs. We did not buy any of that. We have lots of friends that did. And had we you know, bought at the right time, we would have done really well at it. But we didn't understand it. We do understand it you know, intellectually. Conceptually, sure. Conceptually. But all we saw was, was a gamble. That's not an investment. It was a gamble. Too speculative. Right. Whereas you do what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger say. And by the way, some of the wealthiest people in the world. Vanguard index funds are your friend. And here's a little uh, go and Google because some of you absolutely positively need to do this to protect yourself from yourself right? You have no software in your head that is uh, created for you to build wealth. It's just the opposite. You're designed to essentially have enough money coming in for the next 60 to 90 days. You're not designed to build long-term wealth. That's something that you either are born with or you learn, generally speaking, from your family. So I'm going to assume none of you were born with it or none of you have learned from your families. Teach yourselves. But here's the thing that Julie and I learned a long time ago. We don't trust ourselves. No, we don't. We don't trust ourselves when it comes to our ability to choose a winner from a loser. So we do what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger tell us to do. And that is going to be Vanguard Index Funds. Google um, uh, Bogleheads. Bogleheads, B-O-G-L-E. Bogleheads 3 Fund Portfolio. Just Google Bogleheads 3 Fund Portfolio. Enough about that. Rule number five. Rule number five. Your goal should be to have five non-interdependent sources of passive income that cover your monthly personal overhead. Not just one, not just two. Something could happen to those. Let's drill down Five. on that. So and you guys know, you're longtime listeners and you've read our book and you're coaching clients that we want you to have uh, you know, spokes in your wheel. And we want you to have five to seven predictable spokes that are not dependent on each other. What does that mean? A, For example, in your business, or let's just say focus on rule number five. If your only sources of income are derived from a real estate transaction that you or your team are having to do and you rationalize, well, I'm making a little bit from mortgage, I'm making a little bit from the commission, I'm making a little bit from a home warranty, I'm making a processing fee, whatever. You've rationalized that those are different sources of income. They're not. They're all one source of income. It's from a real estate transaction. And it happens once. Then you have to go do it all over again. Exactly. Remember, rich is where your money works for you. You no longer work for your money. And your ultimate goal is to whatever your monthly overhead is. And remember, Julie and I have been veering you guys towards not having a lifestyle creep to making it so that you do have a manageable amount of money that you have to pay every month versus some huge extraordinary number. A lot of you who have huge extraordinary numbers now, you're reeling that all in because of this new market. But have a manageable amount of number, uh, um, let's call it 10,000 a month, that means you should work towards having five sources of interdependent sources of income. In other words, like I said, not dependent on each other that are going to be able to produce at least 10000 a month. Look, if you get to two or three, you're doing really damn good. So let's just be honest, but really have five. And the examples, Julie? Examples would be rental income, dividend income, income from business ownership, businesses that are not interdependent on each other. Revenue share would be one of those. Again, something that continues to pay you month in and month out passively. That's the reason, probably the main reason why so many agents are flocking to eXp Realty is because eXp Realty, yes, still continue to sell real estate, sell a ton of real estate. But what eXp does is embedded, built into the eXp Realty system is a way for you to create passive income from doing what you're already doing. I'm talking about the fact that you can buy stock at a discount or you're awarded stock for what you're already doing. I'm talking about revenue share. There are so many in, uh, absolutely genius level things that are created into eXp. It's the reason that we're so massively enthusiastic about it because we see so many of you, you're able to create essentially abundance without actually having to do what frankly we did which is buy a bunch of rental properties 
And we get asked all the time, if you guys were to do it all over again, what would you rather do? Buy a bunch of rental properties, which is what we ended up doing, or would you rather, if you had the opportunity back, you know, when you got into real estate, focus on EXP revenue share? There is no doubt we would have focused all of our energies on revenue share. We probably still would have bought rental properties, but the amount of money that we put towards and effort to this day that we put towards rental properties versus revenue share, there are no comparisons. Also, they're not that passive. They're not that passive. We talk about EXP all the time because we are truly 100% certain it's the next natural step for all of you. And we've made it simple. If you're ready to learn more about EXP, you're not quite ready to join, you're looking for information, just text the letters EXP to 47372. Text the letters EXP to 47372. Or if you're ready to take the next natural step and you're looking for a sponsor that's going to be very proactive in your success at EXP Realty, Julie and I are formally applying for the job of being that very sponsor for you. Text me directly on my cell phone, which is 512-758-0206. That is my real cell phone number. Text me. Just text EXP and a little bit of information about yourself. Text the letters EXP, a little bit of information yourself. That goes directly to my cell phone, 512-758-0206. And I will follow up, and it will be me, and we'll have a conversation about helping you move forward with EXP. If you're just getting started again, you have two paths here. Just text the letters EXP to 47372, or if you're ready to join and you're looking for a sponsor and you've not yet chosen a sponsor, text me directly at 512-758-0206. And then I'll expose you guys to all the ways that you can essentially create financial freedom and true financial freedom in your lives because of the model that EXP is. For all of you, it's the way forward. I'm 100% certain of that. Give it a look, give it a try, text EXP to 47372, or if you're ready to join, obviously text me directly, 512-758-0206. Remember when texting, message and data rates may apply. Rule number eight, Julie. Six, rule number six. Oh, am I really that far ahead? Yeah, you're right. Excuse me. So uh, rule number six, keep your revenue from your primary business, which for most of you is going to be your real estate uh, transactions, but keep that operating at the highest level and make it so you never need the money from your new sources of income, from your investments, from your passive income. And that's a big point, right? So let's say you really made some great investments and you're getting some passive income. Don't make that replace what got you there in the first place? This is in addition to, not instead of, your adi- your primary business. So that's part of the machine. The machine is you're still going to transact. You're still going to sell real estate. But the money that's coming from your passive investments or your revenue share from EXP or your dividends or your stocks or whatever it is, that money then isn't spent on lifestyle or business. That money's then reinvested. That's how you compound wealth at a exponential rate that you can, frankly, it'll change your lives. And it's not that difficult to do. It's easier to do if your personal overhead is not that huge. That is going to be one of the things that all of you need to consider. Like if you're choosing to essentially have this big showy lifestyle and you're spending all of your money, which some of you do, well, then there's a reason why you don't have enough you know, money left over to actually do some of these things that create passive income. I will ask you this one question. If you're 35 or 25 or even 45 and you're not producing enough profit in your business to act, or even net income that's producing because you're spending it all, you got to ask yourself, 10 years from now into the future, the 10 years you're having that conversation with that 10 year older version of you or 20 year older version of you, you know, as well as I do, if you ask that, you know, older version of you, what is the one thing that I should have been doing now that I didn't, I promise you, you're going to tell you that you should have been listening to our previous points about creating passive income because the older you get, the harder it is to stay on that hamster wheel, not because physically you're unable, because mentally and emotionally, you are seeing the, you're essentially on the second half of your life and you're now realizing you're spending a lot of it as having to stay on that hamster wheel. I appreciate the fact that a lot of you love it and you enjoy it. Well, love it and enjoy it, keep doing it, but from the passive income that you've created from investing your profit uh, from your business and revenue share from, say, EXP, you then now can completely change the trajectory of not just your life, but the lives of everyone you choose to share your abundance with. That's right. So your new passive sources of income are supposed to be producing income that is then, again, reinvested. Your money is literally working for you. You guys get it? Your Rich is where your money works for you. You no longer have to work for your money. 
That's right. Rule number seven, monitor your machine. Make adjustments when needed. Know that you can never be truly passive with your machine. It's okay to delegate, but don't abdicate. Tim, what's the difference between delegating and abdicating? Well, I mean, this is, again, something you and I learned. I remember our first year in real estate, and this is when we were kids, and this was back in the 90s. We earned over $300,000, mm-hmm. and that was a lot of money then, and it's a lot of money now, and it was a hell of a lot of money to young Tim and Julie. <laughs> yeah. And I remember the first year we owed a crap ton of taxes, and we hadn't saved for it. No one told us about that. We had no <laughs> information. It hadn't really occurred to us yet. And we went to our accountant thinking the accountant was going to have some sort of, you know, witchcraft and alchemy to make our tax problem go away. Nope. Tax uh, preparer's job is to prepare your taxes and here's Send the, them off. And here's how much you owe. I'll never forget. It was a gal who was doing our taxes, yeah. driving into our parking lot, walking in. She gave me this, you know, a manila folder with all of our filings in it that we had to then sign and mail off yep. and then the amount due. It was extraordinary. It was absolutely shocking. And guess what? We had the money, but it was not something we were wanting to do. And that's something that's going to be an eye-opener for all of you. Because why? We did not, we delegated, but we also abdicated. We didn't know what we didn't know. We trusted other people. When you want to accumulate wealth, here's a, a little rule for all of you. Whoever you're asking for advice, make sure that they are rich themselves. Don't follow yes. or take advice from people who are not better off financially than you. Not just a little better off, but a lot better off. Those people are out there. You're going to have to pay more, but it's completely worth it. Ask for referrals from other people that are where you want to be. Again, not just the next level in your life, but 10 levels up. Ask them who they use for their wealth planning. Ask them who they use for their taxes. And then you're going to start finding people that are actually going to help pull you up the mountain. But you cannot abdicate. You cannot give up control of your financial future or any aspect of your business for that matter. Rule number eight. Rule number eight. And then I've got to scoot to a coaching call. Focus on fewer things. You can only really control three things. Things. Write these down. Wealth, we've been talking about that a lot. Health and your environment. And we've done entire podcasts on this before. Wealth, you do control what you earn, spend, and invest. If you have any doubt, review the previous points. <laughs> okay. Health, you can control what goes into your body and what you do with your body. Now, I want to say something about this because people will say, well, you know, I can't totally control it because I inherited this or that or I'm genetically defective here or there. Okay. Well, that has been proven to be reprogrammable with epigenetics, that you can turn your genes on or off depending on your behavior, okay? So yes, all of that may be true, but your lifestyle, your fitness level, what you do with your body, what you're eating, your nutrition can change that trajectory, can't it? For you, those of you who want to get control of your health, we're going to give you a quick bunch of keywords, write these down. Number one, men and ladies for that, for that you know, matter, do uh, look into hormone replacement therapy, HRT. We're not doctors. We're not physicians. We're not nurses. We're just saying look into it. Look into it. Look into HRT. Find a, a legitimate HRT clinic. Your GP is not going to be an expert on this. So go to somebody that is, and you will learn that oftentimes one of the things that happens, well, one of the most, I think, you know, things that people just take for granted is as they age, as they get older, your body's hormones start to deplete. They start, your your chemistry changes. You can get those back into healthy ranges and then guess what happens? You actually want to exercise. Your body doesn't gain the same amount of, of you know, body weight. You actually can essentially reverse the effects of aging with hormonal uh, re- hormone replacement therapy. Number two, you can control, again, what Julie was saying in regards to what you eat. Julie and I have been low carb for... I don't know how long, 20 years. years? Yeah. yeah. We were low carb. We got fat twice. <laughs> and the second time we decided we weren't going to get fat again. So we had been low carb for at least a decade, probably more like 15 years. And that totally works for us. So here's a little secret for all of you. Getting your health in, uh, alignment, actually getting your body to the point where you're proud of it is not that difficult. It all goes to the third point, which Julie said, which is your environment. That's your physical environment. That's your mental environment. That does include things like what you read, what you listen to, the websites you go to. Your environment is the most important thing. And frankly, it's the hardest thing to control because you could be finding yourself in a frankly, a real estate office where everyone's negative and everyone's overweight and you walk in there and let's just stay on the weight thing. You are walking there. Everyone's, let's say, everyone says they're 20 pounds overweight. 
When you say you're 20 pounds overweight, you're probably more like 30 or 35 pounds overweight. Remember, we were fat. We used to say 20 pounds and it was really so 30. we can say that. We can say that, right. So you walk into your office where everyone's, you know, 30 pounds overweight and you say, I'm going to lose weight. Do you think those people are going to reinforce you getting skinny? No, they're going to say, you look great. Don't you worry look about great. It. What are you talking about? Maybe you just need to buy a higher size. You wear it well. <laughs> exactly. Jumbo, jumbo, you, you triple. You just have, what's the other one? You have a large body uh, profile or whatever, you know, big where they bones. tell you, yeah, big bones. Exactly. You guys get the point. So that's your environment. Be omnipresent of omni, omnipresently aware of all the things you're allowing into your brain. You could have the strongest Tony Robbins level mindset and you could be walking on the world and then all of a sudden you trip over some bad news or you ha read a bad headline or somebody starts with, hey, Bob, did you hear about the tragedy that just happened in here or there or the other thing? And the next thing you know, you're finding yourself thinking about horrible things. Control your environment. Focus on fewer things. Let fewer people have influence on you. Be highly selective on what you expose yourself to. One of the things that Julie and I did years ago, and all of our top coaching clients do this as well, be media free in the sense that completely and totally remove from your life mainstream media. It's all propaganda. That's the reason, by the way, podcasts have become so popular. Podcasts are the fastest form of uh, digital media because people are finding that they can get the drilled down specialized information they want from podcasts that they can't get any more from the media because the media is all biased. You know, they're essentially giving you what you want to read and hear, and none of it's good for your mindset. Here's the ultimate litmus test to know whether or not you are actually in the environment that you need to be in. Ask yourself how you feel when you go into your real estate brokerage. Ask yourself how you feel when you essentially are living the life you're living. If you find yourself essentially stressed, if you find yourself feeling clenched, if you find yourself feeling um, really anything that's negative, anything that's going to result in you not wanting to be of service to other people, you have got an environmental issue. When you go to a website and you read things, does it make you feel abundant and, and does it make you feel happy? Does it make you feel wanna, like you want to go out there and help people? Or does it make you feel like you want to hide under the staircase and wait for the zombie apocalypse to be over? Isn't that interesting? Well, and if you go into your office, ask yourself how many agents, brokers, trainers in your office are crying real estate crash right now? Exactly. You know, does that give you a warm and fuzzy feeling? Why do people do that, guys? Have you ever thought about that? Why are people so attracted to the negative? We have a theory. You know what the theory is? Here it is. Because they want to be complacent. Because if you don't believe that tomorrow is going to be better than today, if you don't believe that, for example, your best years are still ahead of you, if you don't believe that you can be incredibly successful because of this real estate market, you're going to do things to make that true. So if you're finding yourself reading and listening to people that say the doom day of, of real estate sales are here, whatever you know people are saying, you you find yourself reading those bullshit headlines, it's because you're looking for reasons not to do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level. You want to believe that what's the point of me making the effort? Actually, obviously, tomorrow is going to be worse than today. By the way, tomorrow is never worse than today. We are on a long, uh, essentially, if you look at humanity, if you look at especially the last maybe 500 years, everything has gotten better at enormous rates and the rate of change of improvement is even increasing. Welcome AI. Welcome AI's advancements with healthcare. Welcome some of the other things that we're experiencing. Tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will be extraordinary compared to today. Believe that and you will make it true. In the meantime, you guys, thank you for continuing to make this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right, and don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're gonna love that one.